combination of evidence that challenged materialistic theories of life's origin. He discovered that this negative evidence contradicted the textbook explanations that had once convinced him the blind forces of evolution could account for the creation and diversity of life on Earth. A good example of negative evidence is the 1953 origin of life experiment by Stanley Miller, the one that helped lead me into atheism in the first place. As biologist Jonathan Wells explained to me, Miller's experiment has now been thoroughly discredited. Stanley Miller put together a glass apparatus and in that apparatus he put a mixture of gases that people at the time thought reflected the atmosphere of the early Earth. And those gases were methane, ammonia, hydrogen, and water vapor. But then the professional opinion of what was there on the early Earth changed. In the 60s, geochemists uh, revised their hypothesis and decided that the hydrogen, being very light, would have escaped into outer space. The Earth's gravity isn't strong enough to hold it. And probably the early Earth's atmosphere then consisted of what we now see coming out of volcanoes today, namely carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and water vapor. Well, if the early Earth's atmosphere consisted of those gases, then Stanley Miller's experiment would not work. In fact, he himself tried it with those gases, and he found that uh, he couldn't produce any amino acids at all. So the experiment falls apart once you use a more realistic mixture of gases in the apparatus. Miller's test has been repeated many times using the correct atmospheric components. The results are always the same. The amino acids that generated so much enthusiasm in 1953 do not appear. Even if Miller's experiment were valid, you're still light years away from making life. It comes down to this. No matter how many molecules you can produce with early Earth conditions, plausible conditions, you're still nowhere near producing a living cell. And here's how I know. If I take a sterile test tube and I put in a little bit of fluid with just the right salts, just the right balance of acidity and alkalinity, just the right temperature, the perfect solution for a living cell, and I put in it one living cell, this cell is alive. It has everything it needs for life. Now I take a sterile needle and I poke that cell and all its stuff leaks out into this test tube. You have in this nice little test tube all the molecules you need for a living cell. Not just the pieces of the molecules, but the molecules themselves. And you cannot make a living cell out of them. You can't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. So what makes you think that a few amino acids dissolved in the ocean are going to give you a living cell? It's totally unrealistic. Stanley Miller's experiment was not the only unsuccessful attempt to explain how life originated. Beginning with Russian chemist Alexander Oparin's work in the 1920s, theorists have also proposed chance, chemical attraction, and biological seeding from outer space as possible answers. Each has failed to account for how non-living chemicals could have arranged themselves into the most basic components of the first living cell. Strobel's research ultimately led him to conclude that materialistic explanations for the origin of life were deeply flawed. And his examination of negative evidence did not end with the question of first life. He also learned of weaknesses in the most celebrated icon of Darwinian evolution. In Darwin's book on the origin of species, there's only one illustration. It's called the Tree of Life. Darwin used it to explain how every species of animal and plant that ever existed on Earth had evolved from the same common ancestor through small, gradual steps over enormous periods of time. Even though Darwin's Tree of Life is included in virtually every biology textbook published over the last half century, contrary to what we've been told, there is no conclusive evidence of the common origin of all life. Perhaps the most damaging blow to Darwin's theory is the fossil record. 
If all living organisms have descended from the same primitive life form, then the rock strata of the Earth should be filled with the fossilized remains of animals that were once part of a great evolutionary chain. A chain of small biological modifications ultimately leading to a spectacular diversity of life. Yet, after two centuries of research, highlighted by excavations in southern China, the multitude of transitional experiments, or missing links, that should exist are conspicuous only by their absence. The most graphic example of this void in the fossil record is a geological era known as the Cambrian Explosion. The branching tree pattern of Darwin's theory is actually not seen anywhere in the fossil record unless we impose it with our own minds. So the Cambrian Explosion is the most dramatic refutation of the Tree of Life. The Cambrian Explosion of Life was a dramatic episode in geological history. Usually dated at about 530 million years ago, the exquisitely preserved Cambrian fossils reveal that the body plans for virtually every major animal phyla appeared, not gradually and slowly as Darwin had speculated, but instead with astonishing suddenness. If we imagine the whole history of life on Earth taking place in one 24-hour period, the current uh, standard estimates for the origin of life put it at about 3.8 billion years ago, let's say 4 billion. So if we start the clock then, our 24-hour clock, six hours, nothing but these simple single-celled organisms appear, the same sort that we saw in the beginning. 12 hours, same thing. 18 hours, same thing. Three quarters of the day has passed, and all we have are these simple, single-celled organisms. Then at about the 21st hour, in the space of about two minutes, boom, most of the major animal forms appear in the form that they currently have in the present. And many of them persist to the present, and we have them with us today. Less than two minutes out of a 24-hour period. That's how sudden the Cambrian explosion was. In a geological instant, the animal kingdom leaped from small, relatively simple organisms to extraordinary creatures with spinal cords, compound eyes, and articulated limbs. The record of this explosion of life looks nothing like Darwin's slowly branching tree. Darwin's theory is that there's a tree of life where you have one organism diverging into many other organisms and big differences appearing at the top. What we really see is from here up. This does not exist in the fossil record. If I were using a botanical illustration, it would be a lawn with separate blades of grass sprouting independently of each other. And those would be the phyla. Now within each phylum, there is subsequent diversification. But even there, I don't see the branches connecting that would make them a tree of life. As scientists, it's not our job to force the evidence into a theory that just doesn't fit it. And so I have absolutely no desire or reason to uphold Darwin's theory at this point. I think what we're seeing today is a series of scientific discoveries that are opening the eyes of more and more scientists to say, wait a minute, I can no longer believe that pure naturalistic processes can account for the origin and diversity of life. There must be something else here. The challenges to Darwinian theory have led more than 600 scientists with PhDs from major universities throughout the world to sign a document titled, A Scientific Descent from Darwinism. It reads in part, we are skeptical of the claims for the ability of random mutation and natural selection to account for the complexity of life. These are scientists with PhDs from Stanford and Berkeley and University of Chicago and Cambridge, major universities, who've looked hard and fast at the evidence and have walked away saying, I am not convinced. Maybe there's another explanation. Personally, the negative evidence forced me to conclude that Darwinism would require a blind leap of faith that I just had no good reason to make.